When the full-scale invasion began in February 2022, pictures of railway stations and trains crammed full of mostly women and children fleeing the country were headlining the news all over the world. To ensure the safe departure of those fleeing the Russian bombardment, with air traffic completely suspended and roads hopelessly overrun, the Ukrainian train company, Ukrzaleznica, decided to suspend the obligation to buy tickets, offering a free and vital lifeline. An estimated 4 million people fled the conflict via train in the first months of the war. Riding the train at that time was incredibly scary. Trains would be rerouted, drive in the nighttime without lights, and sometimes just stand for hours in the middle of nowhere for safety reasons. But not just for civilian purposes, also for military logistics, the railroad is indispensable for both Russia and Ukraine. Soldiers are transported incognito via train to the front line, but also ammunition and supplies are often delivered on tracks. Welcome to Talking Tactics, where this week, as you've guessed, it's all about trains. To understand why the Ukrainian railroad network is so critical for both sides in this war, one has to take a look at the history. A lot of the railroad infrastructure was destroyed or at least heavily damaged during World War II. The Soviets, however, began to rebuild the Ukrainian railroad network in the 50s as part of their infrastructure plan. They really invested a lot, and until today, there exists an astonishing number of train tracks that connect Ukraine to large parts of Russia, Belarus, and Central Asia. With over 19,000 kilometers of tracks, it was one of the largest railroad systems in the world. Railroad infrastructure was especially developed in the eastern part of Ukraine, as it is the country's industrial hub. Coal, steel, and many things more had to be transported from there via train since trucks were too inefficient for these quantities. One of the largest locomotive plants in the world was in now occupied Lugansk until its closure due to the war in 2015. People of the region used to jokingly ask each other, so what are you, a coal miner or a railroad worker? Both are considered not just normal occupations, but are seen as some sort of identity, a lifestyle if you will. Miners and their families are close-knit communities, and so are railroad workers, a profession that is often pursued through generations. In the past years, Ukraine focused on modernizing and connecting the train network to the rest of Europe. After the Maidan Revolution in 2014 and the consequential ousting of President Viktor Yanukovych, the railroad company was reformed. In 2015, Ukrzaleznica was turned into a joint stock company. Before that, it was in fact run by six different administrations. The old six administrative regions from Soviet times still exist formally, although the chain of command and responsibilities are now centralized. The majority shareholder of Ukrzaleznica is the Ukrainian state. There is a new CEO since this March, a man called Yevgen Yashenko. So you see, although Ukrzaleznica is structured like a private company, the state remains quite influential, and for the obvious reason that the whole country depends on a functioning rail network. Ukrzaleznica has been called the country's second army, and it remains the largest state employer. Now the war, which has been concentrating itself more and more in the southern and eastern parts of the country, has had a great effect on the dynamics of the whole railroad system. To give you just an idea, before the war in 2014, over 45% of loading and 35% of unloading of all cargo transport in Ukraine was in these regions. From there, the most important routes were to Russia, but also to the country's largest seaports in now occupied Mariupol as well as Odessa. From here, Ukrainian products used to make their way all over the world. Obviously, the economic impact of this conflict since 2014 and large parts of the country were split into the so-called People's Republics were quite detrimental. And this brings us to the other side of the coin. Also, Russia relies heavily on trains. Not only do they profit from using this existing railroad network to exploit and steal resources now under their control, by exporting, for example, Ukrainian coal or grain, but since it's such a big country with large distances, they rely heavily on trains to transport soldiers, equipment and ammunition to the front line. This has turned a lot of the strategic orientation by both militaries towards these vital supply lines. So the fight is not just about key cities or roads, but also about rail tracks. So let's take a look at the map. One of the most important Russian supply lines since the beginning of their invasion was from the city of Rostov na Donu, one of their central ports where there's also a large navy and air base to Donetsk. So they fly people and equipment to Rostov and from there it travels via train to the Donetsk region. Another critical route was from the cities of Izum and Liman. Liman, which is quite a small town, was in fact the major railroad hub and also the administrative central of the Donetsk railroad region. From here, there's a direct track running from Liman via Kupiansk. At Kupiansk, the tracks can take a right turn. From there, you can travel to central Donetsk. But the railroad essentially continues all the way to the Russian capital, Moscow. Today, the city is Ukrainian again, but it's largely destroyed. The liberation of Liman during the Ukrainian counteroffensive last autumn came at a heavy price but the negative effect on Russian supply lines is undisputed. The Russians are still desperately trying to recapture this railroad line. If you look, for example, at Live UA map, you can see that a lot of shelling is concentrated at this track. 
However, Russia has had little success in recapturing it so far. The Russians are also employing armored trays, which are used not only for transport, but also for reconnaissance and attacking. One of these trains is called Yenisei, and according to the Ukrainian side, it was built with stolen cars from the Kharkov region. Also, it's highly disputed how efficient this kind of train really is in the year 2023, and Yenisei, for example, has faced a lot of ridicule in the internet. And it really does look a bit clumsy, impractical, and historical. Armored trains are not a new Russian invention, of course, they have quite a bit of history, but with modern observation techniques and ever more precise missiles, they have become more and more vulnerable. Especially because the running track severely limits where a train can go, it makes the projected travel route incredibly predictable. You just use Google Maps and you have the coordinates of the train tracks. On Monday, the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense announced that a train transporting Russian caliber cruise missiles was destroyed in the town of Jankoy, in Russian-occupied Crimea. The railroad connecting Crimea between the Russian mainland and the occupied territories in Ukraine is also a crucial supply line for Russia. By the way, not only Ukraine is fighting with Russia over access to the railroads, train tracks have become an important target for the Russian and Belarusian partisan movements. There are many active partisan groups in these countries, but one of the biggest and most active is the so-called combat organization of anarcho-communists, who sabotage trains, sometimes causing them to derail in order to stop military equipment from ever reaching Ukraine. According to a report by The Insider, 63 freight trains derailed in Russia between March and June 2022. The combat organization of anarcho-communists have claimed responsibility for sabotage operations conducted near Moscow, Belgorod, Barnaul, Hirzhaj, and Krasnoyarsk. But of course, as Russia's war of aggression continues, the Ukrainian rail infrastructure and the civilian population are those who suffer the most in what some are calling the rail wars. The Russian army specifically and aggressively targets the rail infrastructure without any regard for human life. About 30% of the entire Ukrainian railroad was reportedly destroyed in the first two months of the war, causing damages worth around 100 billion US dollars. By the end of June 2022, 177 railroad employees were reportedly killed and 257 were injured. Just an interesting side fact, if you drive around Ukraine today, you might see steel train wagons being parked randomly around the country. These are refrigerated storage cars. They contain mostly dead Russian soldiers. Ukraine and Russia don't only exchange prisoners from time to time, but they exchange dead bodies. The currency, if you will, is one for one. Hopefully, this has been a helpful if yet quite brief explanation as to why and how the railroad is not only of extreme strategic importance for both sides. For Ukraine, the railroad is also a backbone, a lifeline, a symbol of persistence that no matter how bad things get, the trains will keep rolling. When the city of Kherson was liberated in autumn last year, one of the first steps to reintegrating the city to Ukraine was the re-establishment of the train connection. On the 19th of November, the first Ukrainian train entered the main station and was met by an emotional crowd. It might sound a little cheesy or corny, but efforts like these represent not only the reviving of a lost connection, but pictures of relatives and friends crying at the train station after enduring months of brutal occupation were an important symbol of hope and some kind of normality among all this madness. Until this day, and in spite of a constant threat to their lives, the workers of the Ukrainian railroad are doing everything they can to uphold as many connections as possible. Thank you for watching Talking Tactics. Hit like and subscribe. See you next week.